Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam. Uh, welcome everyone that's here so far. I know people will be rolling in. MashaAllah, we have 20 people with us right now. Um, my name is Yahya Van Roy. I am a elementary principal at an American Islamic school in Dubai called Next Generation School. I'm also a um, uh, leadership team of ISLA, the Islamic Schools League of America. And I'm now a very proud member of the steering committee of the Global Association of Islamic Schools, which has just formed and we'll hear a little bit about here shortly. Um, but the main uh, event for tonight is a discussion with Dr. Abdullah Shaheen, who I will introduce shortly. Um, I'm sure we're all very much looking forward to an engaging conversation, inshallah. Before we get to that, I'm going to allow Brother Zafar to share briefly about the GAIS, the Global Association of Islamic Schools, so we can learn what this uh, new entity is all about, inshallah. Brother Zafar, over to you. Jazakallah, thank you very much, uh, Brother Yahya. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to all of our guests that have joined us from uh, many parts of the world, mashallah. Um, I'll just take two minutes very quickly. Uh, many of you are already on the Global Association Islamic Schools uh, link, uh, part of the group, so you're familiar with what we're doing, but there are a number of people uh, that have just joined for this event, and so I take a, advantage of this opportunity to introduce this organization called the Global Association of Islamic Schools. Uh, basically, this what we try to do is that there are a number of associations in various parts of the world, all trying to further Islamic education. And we believe that if we pull our resources together, we need, all, need, we need not all reinvent the wheel, and we can support each other in our in our uh, in our work, inshallah. So this is what uh, this organization oh, strives to um, do. So we formed this organization. The idea was to get associations of Muslim schools from around the world to collaborate and share resources and strengthen Islamic schools throughout the world. We spent some time on defining our logo, of who we are, our logo. Each item in the logo has a sense of symbolism in it. I'm not going to take time and spend all of that. This is our vision statement that we envision a world where Islamic schools positively impact their communities by educating students who embody Ahsan, moral, spiritual, and intellectual excellence. Our mission for the Global Association of Islamic Schools is to bring Islamic schools together to build global solidarity and promote a culture of excellence. We provide thought leadership, networking opportunities, and research-based standards for a holistic and relevant education, inshallah, so that every Muslim school in every part of the world can fulfill this particular vision, inshallah. We're in the process of uh, refining our organizational values. We have 10 that we've identified. We're just streamlining this in the next few days. We'll have this sorted out, inshallah. We've uh, current projects that we engaged in. We're in the process of registering a not-for-profit entity in the name of the Global Association of Islamic Schools. We're not sure of the geography yet, but it's likely to be uh, in the UK, perhaps with regional offices in Malaysia, South Africa, and various other countries. We are in the process of developing a very dynamic and interactive website that would be a portal for sharing information we have a whole element on this website on integration and Islamization of content, inshallah. Currently, we have a very active WhatsApp group. And on the WhatsApp group, we have a weekly question of provocation. And this is to create awareness and generate thought sharing amongst members of the global community. We also introduced today being the first one, a scholar series. So we hope that each month we will host one scholar on a particular topic of relevance. Uh, and so this is the first of those. And we're very blessed to have our guest with us today. So inshallah, every month, the first Saturday of every month, we'll host a webinar with a scholar from around the world, inshallah. 
We're also working to host a global conference on Islamic education, and we hope that we'll do this to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the first ever conference that took place on Islamic education held in Makkah in 1977. So in three years' time, it will be the 50th Hijri anniversary of that conference, and we intend, inshallah, to host, if Allah wills, an in-person global conference to commemorate the 50th, but it will also be a global conference on Islamic education, inshallah. And I'm in the process of establishing a team of scholars from around the world to collaborate specifically on the issue of integration or what some people call Islamization of knowledge to make sure that we have an Islamic worldview in the core school subjects and, school, uh, and topics as well. So uh, we're busy with these six projects at the moment. And uh, if you haven't joined us yet and you'd like to, or if you have contacts of people you believe will strengthen our work, please get in touch with us. Uh, and we'd, glad, uh, we'd like to sort of include as many people as possible. Jazakallah, thank you very much. Okay, Jazakallah khair, uh, Brother Zafar. So um, I will introduce our, our guest scholar tonight, uh, Dr. Abdullah Shaheen. And then I will offer a few um, reflections of my own to help frame our conversation. Um, we have a nice sized group. Initially, there were 70 people signed up. So we have a little over 20, which allows us all to engage more. And I think a lot of people signed up for the recording too. So we'll be able to share that for those that weren't able to join us. Um, so I would like to introduce Dr. Shaheen. And I have this, uh, this a bio from the, from the website. And then I added my own piece at the end here from... <laughs> from the, uh, the book that I've been reading. Um, so Dr. Shaheen uh, comes from an Islamic studies, theology and educational studies and social studies background. He has conducted research on religious identity formation among British Muslim youth and worked on educational strategies to address the impact of religious extremism within Muslim minority and majority contexts. Dr. Shaheen is the author of New Directions in Islamic Education, which I've been engaged with over the last uh, month now um, on pedagogy and identity formation and has developed the first recognized master's level degree program on Islamic education within the UK higher education system. And if you've had a chance to read the introduction of the book, you also learn some interesting things about Dr. Abdullah, um, which is that he studied under his grandfather, mashallah, the local imam of a village in Turkey in addition to uh, going through the state-sponsored religious education and then on to the Islamic theology school at the Divinity School in Ankara. And after that, on to the University of Birmingham to complete his graduate work. And now he's at the University of, um, is it Warwick? Warwick, I believe, the University of Warwick. So mashallah, uh, a, a wide ranging uh, experience of Islamic education. Um, and I really encourage you to, to read this. I really love this introduction and getting to know about uh, Dr. Abdullah, his, his personal journey as well. That was really interesting for me. Um, so I thought I would share just a few reflections and then we can hear a bit from Dr. Abdullah and then we can engage in, in conversation and discussion. And what I hope we get out of our, our session tonight is the same thing that the four of us of the steering committee got out when we met with Dr. Shaheen uh, a couple weeks ago, and that was really inspired and renewed thinking about Islamic education and what is having impact. And this is what I reflected on and took back to my own school in terms of what, and this is a question I would frame our conversation with, how might we, how might we make Islamic education transformative or how might we make our Islamic schools transformative? And a few of the takeaways for me reading this uh, book and engaging with Dr. Shaheen was asking that question and, and seeing why are our schools not really producing transformed Muslims who develop a mature and resilient faith that is able to engage with the modern world. And myself having embraced Islam, Alhamdulillah, five years ago, I found that very powerfully in my own experience that Islam really is a religion of personal transformation. And as Dr. Shaheen says in the book, the Quran is a book of guidance and transformation. And that was my 
personal experience, alhamdulillah. But when I got into Islamic schools, I found that many of, in, many, in many ways that was not the case. And it was the work that Dr. Abdullah did really confirmed much of what I had seen with Islamic schools not producing transformed souls, but rather a really a foreclosed, the term that he uses in the book, foreclosed mindset, and often a very immature faith that was not able to engage with the modern world. And so in my own journey in Islamic education over the last three years, I've really set out in search of where are models that will produce this type of transformation. And so the, the book has really been a homecoming for me. And I am incredibly grateful to Dr. Shaheen for the work he's done, which I know has transformed his own life from what he shared in, in the book. And so it's something that I hope we can all think about tonight. And some of the questions I propose there that Dr. Shaheen uh, proposes in the book, which is one, what does it mean to be educated Islamically in the modern world? Another one, how do we start thinking about Islam educationally? And that one really was a powerful reflection for me. How do we start thinking about Islam educationally and education Islamically. And then the third question I put there was about a transformative education model, which Dr. Abdullah has developed called the Tarbiya model of transformative Islamic education. And that itself was also a really powerful uh, model that I look forward to learning more about and finding ways to implement. And so as educators here, I hope what we can think about is how do we implement these ideas and what things are you already doing that are having this type of transformative impact. So I thought, Dr. Abdullah, we could begin with just a few thoughts, maybe your own answer to those questions, or for questions for us to think about as a global association too, with this mission and vision, really to do that, to transform students. This process of Isan is really one of transformation. So I will open it with that brief reflection. And someone asked about the title of the book, I will put that in the chat. It's uh, New Directions in Islamic Education. And there's a link as well with a number of articles and lectures, which I hope that many of you who haven't already will engage with further after our discussion tonight. So Dr. Abdullah, I will turn over the mic to you to uh, begin our conversation tonight, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Yahya. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah ala deen al-Islam wa tawfiq al-Iman wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Uh, first of all, I'm really grateful for his kind invitation. I thought uh, our initial conversation uh, was very interesting, but I thought you might simply say, well, this is an interesting guy, but uh, let's have a piece for this engagement. <laughs> so very pleased that I was re-invited or invited back to carry on this conversation further. Uh, to the members of the Global Association of Islamic Schools. Um, second, I'm really impressed, Brother Yahya, this is not, uh, as in Arabic they say, mujamala, it's not exaggeration. I think your engagement with the book probably is a, a model way of engaging with any kind of um, book. Not, not only you've read the whole stuff, but you really picked up the very key contributions that the book was trying to make, uh, but also you picked up on my personal journey at the very introduction. Not many people actually read that stuff, but I, I thought that was probably much more important to understand uh, how I arrived at that point on, on my journey, first as a you know, student of Islam and then turn into researching Islamic education issues, and then uh, trying to rethink what education is in Islam. So I thought that was genuinely Impressive, Jazakallah khair. I'm sure the others, when they engage with the book, they have the same experience. Um, in terms of uh, the key point you mentioned is the fact that I started really my journey you know, doing research in terms of uh, inviting people to rethink what education is in Islam. So clearly when you say you know, to Muslim educators who have been teaching Islam for 20 years, uh, you know, we have to rethink what education is in Islam. They might just find it challenging. So, you know, education is a place, as you all know, you know, people say, you know, I have uh, 20 years experience, but in reality, we all know in education, we become quite foreclosed. We have one year genuine 
experience, but 19 years of repetition of the same. So to be innovative and to be able to, uh, I suppose, rethink what we do, it is really difficult. You know, you've got to be a genuinely reflective practitioner to do that. And in Islamic education settings, this is just, well, wasn't available when I was trying to think these issues. So I thought I would, and of course I was posing these questions as someone who really, as I said, it, I came from a formal study of Islam, Sharia, and I studied this Sul al uh, I was really never envisaged myself going into education in certain or education sector. So I, I never really, you know, realized that, you know, a key reason as to why Muslims are quite backward in 21st century is probably to do with maybe education. <laughs> it never crossed my mind. But when I began my study in Muslim minority context of UK, that was, that was my first travel abroad, actually, uh, from my native Turkey. So I realized, you know, the challenges of teaching Islam in a highly modernized, secular, multicultural context. And I realized how communities are less resourced in terms of facilitating an effective Islamic education provision. Uh, and that really was the beginning of my sort of journey. And imagine, of course, these communities are very traditional. They come from very poor backgrounds in their home countries. We have racism, Islamophobia, complex questions. To be able to raise critical point or to, to become a critical voice within is very difficult because the communities are, are experiencing huge amount of racism and Islamophobia and poverty. And you are telling them, right, you know, you've got to be reflective the way in which we teach Islam to our young people. <laughs> that is just was difficult because they all assume Islamic education is really a transmission model where it simply acts as a preserving sort of mechanism for the communities to reproduce their own narratives and whatever cultural identities they have in the life of their young people. There was less interest to, to recognize the fact that these young people are actually quite different. They are living in a different context. And obviously the question of the ethics, because everything is done in the name of Islam, we just justify parental rights. We don't tend to not think young people might have different views of how they are learning Islam, for example. So what I ended up with was the reality of heavily transmission knowledge-oriented, teacher-centered practice, and where the learner was more or less really a very passive recipient. And you know, over the years, obviously, uh, the knowledge of Islam or the values of Islam that we wanted to uh, transmit to young people, it appears once young people are outside the control of the parents or the mosque or the madrasa, uh, that knowledge didn't appear to have at all made sense to these young people. So I call this implicit secularization in the life of these young people. So the, the kind of short real answer to the long sort of story is, in order to be able to compel the key stakeholders, parents, teachers, who invest in Islamic education dearly, uh, to make them understand that actually they have to give them a benefit of doubt to rethink what kind of education they are offering is to produce empirical evidence. So if you have a mass evidence saying, well, actually, look, the kind of activities that you are doing in the mosque address Islamic schools are actually not leading into deeper understanding of Islam, not facilitating growth into faith, right? And this could be maybe it just not because you are bad intentioned, but the fact that maybe you are not qualified as a teacher, maybe you don't have qualified teachers, maybe you just teach the way you are taught somewhere in Pakistan or Bangladesh or Turkey. Maybe you need to really reflect on the pedagogy that you offer, not necessarily content. Uh, because it's very sensitive, you've got to produce empirical evidence. And I, I thought that kind of in the long run paid off for me. Initially, even the empirical findings, people just walked away with it. They simply said, very interesting findings, uh, but you know, we don't want to make a problem in terms of the, how we teach Islam, because this is our identity. From my journey, really, it took massive international events like 9-11, 7-7 bombings, where the communities began to say, well, actually, let's look at beyond the politics, 
how do we facilitate teaching and learning of Islam? And my really, personally, as a Muslim and as a Muslim educator, of course, I began to say, you know, what is education in Islam? Is it really framed to produce some sort of foreclosed mindsets? Maybe education in Islam is transmission model. Maybe it is based on emulation. Uh, maybe you can't really be innovative and there is no language of transformative learning and teaching in Islam. I was saying this because the empirical, empirical evidence from the students, the teachers, the parents, all created that picture for me. So the question was, because we were, or they were qualifying what they did Islamically, because they were telling me this is what education is in Islam. You call it four cause, but we call it, you know, uh, reproducing values in young people. Uh, so the question was, okay, if you are doing as a parent, okay, it's your right. But if you are qualifying your claim Islamically, then you've got to produce evidence for this. And that was an interesting bit for me because I re-engaged with the Quran. Obviously, the Quran is the foundational source, the prophetic traditions. And I began to search to find out how our foundational sources actually frame education. What does it mean to be educated Islamically? And also today, of course, in today's context. Uh, and this is where really journey became very exciting for me because I changed, honestly, my perception of what education is in Islam. Uh, and I realized actually, uh, you know, with my new understanding, because I studied in between psychology, education, and sciences, I became no longer kind of a, somebody who's engaging with Islamic heritage in legal terms, like Islamic law, but I began to engage with Islam educationally, i.e., what kind of mature human beings Islam is imagining to produce. You know, what does it mean to be a human being? You realize education is a very actually complex and most really noble and important area of practice because this is where you enact your ultimate higher values. So the question was, you know, what does the Quran say about human nature, right? If the Quran doesn't have a language of human beings developing, developmental perspective, of course, you can't have a transformative education practice at all. Uh, if the Quran is only talking about transmission, ta'alim, for example, uh, then of course it won't work. So that's why chapter seven in the book is actually where I kind of share my journey of what I call theology of education in Islam. And this is where I really end up with identifying actually Quran is designed to be a transformative education book. And if you genuinely listen, the very opening passages of the Quran depicts it, Rabbul Alameen, Alhamdulillah Rabbul Alameen, uh, is really the key because Rabb, as the classical scholars debate and discusses, is linked with terbiyah. Is where I discovered the concept of terbiyah. And the classical traditions actually explain this. You know, everybody knows who has listened to me in the past. Uh, 11th century great, great scholar, Raghab al-Isfahani, who was almost a teacher of Ghazali, great, and he says, look, uh, you know, Rab, he says, God, the way in which the Quran is introducing the creator, is actually terbiyah fil asl. In fact, it is called Rab because it has an educational function. How? He says, a terbiyah, insha'u shay'i halan fahalan, to facilitate growth and development of something, an organism, until that organism fulfills its potentials. Now, this is a very modern 21st century definition of what education is. But this great scholar was writing in 11th century. He had no access. So the word terbiyah was actually used. Some people misunderstand this. In fact, the word terbiyah does exist in classical tradition. Uh, and therefore, and I began to look at the education and vocabulary of the Quran. In fact, there is a huge psychological framing of a developing, evolving self spiritually, cognitively, emotionally. That was a second important real argument to suggest. And most crucially, if you have change and stages, the change, this is where the word transformation comes from. You see, learning and teaching is not all about passing on information. Depositing information like a bank doesn't mean you are changing with it. But if the knowledge and the skills are helping you to actually change, and the change is not only the quantity of the knowledge, but the very frame, the form in which you look at the world, your worldview changes, then you are changing. 
And Quran has a beautiful language to describe this. Uh, in, 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 in actually, much in, in a very significant detail, the psychology of spiritual development is incredibly vivid. And this kind of transformative dynamic vision of what it means to be educated is actually uh, vividly described in the Islamic core sources. And my discomfort was why people did not look at it like this, because I realized uh, people do not really engage with Islam or the Quran educationally. They may run a school. But they could have, you know, a training in law or I don't know, in languages and something like this. So I realized Islamic education needs to be a really distinctive field of inquiry, interdisciplinary inquiry, because it is more than Islamic studies. You are not simply cognitively studying a subject knowledge. You are actually also dealing with how people learn, what are the challenges of effective teaching, impactful teaching. You, you got to have a high level of framing of the issues. To me, this is really can only be done if you frame the area as Islamic education studies, not Islamic studies only. Um, so I think I spoke too much. Uh, the point is, I think education in Islam, at least within its core sources, framed as transformative practice. We know this, we have no time to explain this. The Quran itself actually teaches and all we need to do is to be curious to find out how does the Quran actually teach its faith to its audiences. And for me, in chapter 7, I explain this. The first audience of the Quran is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As you all know, as the verses in you know, the very famous chapter says, وَوَجَدَ كَبَالًا فَحَدًا you know, Quran is a, is a response primarily to the personal spiritual crisis experienced by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know this very clearly. And when the Quran reaches out to Muhammad Sallallahu what it does, just like any genuine education, it embraces learner's world completely without any judgment. Haven't we found you uh, in error, desperately probing into darkness to find a way out? And we've guided you. This is the Quran, of course, says this because to remind Muhammad Sallallahu that he will never abandon the Prophet. While the Quran begins its transformative education individually, it creates prophetic learner, and then gradually the Quranic education becomes a social, economic, political transformation. But if you miss out the, 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 the very first intimate educational transformative language of the Quran, you will miss out in its education and vision completely. Uh, you can only transform in, individual and society if you have genuinely transformative pedagogies of listening, of responding, and then trying to be genuinely reflective of how you teach. And the Quran actually has huge examples of resources. And I, in my, uh, that, that has led me to actually develop the MA program I teach at Warwick University, which is really the kind of first recognized professional development course in Islamic education. And I get imams and teachers on a journey of 12 months, basically, where we go through the Quran and prophetic resources, and you realize actually, you know, the reconnecting with the Quranic prophetic transformative uh, language of uh, delivering education, being a learner, and, and facilitating learning. Um, and the word, of course, is terbi. I don't have time to explain this. I'm sure if there's a question, we can come back. So the question is, how do we get this transformative Islamic vision today to guide us? That is the answer of what is meant to be educated in the 21st century. You've got to have contextual approach and you've got to be really be willing to have the confidence to rethink what you do. <laughs> if you don't give up the power, there is no way we can change, reconnect. And I'm glad that, alhamdulillah, we have Islamic schools. We have you know, a very large sector. Uh, I think you know, they are being fantastic, of course. We can do more. We can actually you know, create more impact if we also kind of professionalize this whole field, and that means you know, having teacher training colleges, some teacher training colleges, having programs for teacher development, uh, but we also need to keep digging into our heritage uh, to be able to really bring back these transformative, inspiring educational visions. And that requires really people sparing time to actually become proper educators. You know, why don't we have educational philosophers? 
why is it that people who write in education and Islam, they're either philosophers, just generic, or physicists or scientists, sometimes Sharia scholars. I mean, these are all good, good areas and fields, but none of them will make you actually a specialist in education. And that has been my really pain. Why is it that we don't, you know, generally, of course, people don't send their right people to education to become teachers. But if you look at the significance as to, as to how we have to invest in education, why is it that Islamic education hasn't become taken up as, a, as actually a field on its own right? You know, that means you have to study education, psychology, whatever, human sciences, in addition to Islamic theology. That kind of integration, I, I heard Brother mention what integration you know, in Arabic, takamul. I'm very pleased the whole language of Islamization of knowledge has now moved on to takamul, al marif al islamiyah that means integration. But really, integration will not work if you don't have an Islamic educational theory that enables to achieve that, to practice any theory. So we got to encourage people to, to be creative, to look at heritage Islamically, hence discern insights from the heritage. But if you do not shift your engagement with the Quran and prophetic tradition to educational framing, you will never really grasp these transformative impulses that we have in our tradition. And that has been my pain over 20 years now. I've been saying this, that we do need to have a really a specialist investment in Islamic education, where we actually advocate these creative new perspectives to, to be developed models to be developed, and then, of course, put into practice in terms of teacher education, curriculum development, uh, assessment. But none of this could work unless you have a, actually a vision we thought of for 21st century. So I'm hoping that my humble work has made a contribution towards uh, that kind of rethinking, and I've shared the result of my rethinking. They could be right or wrong. Uh, obviously, we have to challenge. This is where uh, you know, we need, to, we need to have platforms like Global Association of Islamic Schools, where we have the you know, confidence of being able to raise critical questions, offer alternative views, and in all in the hope that you know, we, we make Islam understood but by our young people and by people who are not even Muslims. We, we need to have a strategy of you know, public Islamic education, I suppose. And that could only be possible if we have strong educational institutions. Islamic schools, Islamic colleges, even Islamic universities, they are specialists in, in education. for your time, and I'm looking forward to your questions, and I hope my ramblings are intelligible to you, inshallah. Jazakallah khair, Jazakallah khair, Dr. Abdullah. I think you've planted a lot more seeds there for us to consider, and I have a whole page of notes here, but I'm going to restrain myself. And I'll open up the, the floor for anyone that would like to ask a question or comment or share any reflection on what's been shared so far. And I see the first hand has gone up. You can use the hand raise. You can also write it in the chat if you're not able to um, speak. So we'll go first to Abdullah. Go ahead, Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Dr. Abdullah. Jazakallah khair for a very informative discussion. I would like to comment rather than ask a question because I was part of a madrasa and uh, principal of a maktab and now uh, involved in education with Zafar Ahmed uh, as his deputy there. What I want to say is that really when reading the Quran, the transformation begins in how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frames questions. And in the questions that are phrased by Allah to the reader, it engenders in the reader that to transform yourself, you must ask right questions. And I find in schools today, we don't encourage children to ask insightful questions, to ask, to ask provocative questions. Therefore, the transformation we need as teachers then is to begin our, our tarbiyah ourselves. So thank you for that. Secondly, the, the fact that you say that uh, strong education institutions will be the transformation, it is important that we in this global association put our heads together and perhaps begin the first online institution so to speak because of the variety of knowledge out there and the uh, expanse of intellectuals out there that could be the starting point inshallah jazakallah khair yeah absolutely i really agree with you 
teachers are the key and you are right if you don't have an inquiring questioning culture of learning and teaching surely transformation will never occur and you're absolutely spot on uh, questions and challenge are part of Quranic pedagogies indeed you know people assume they, they kind of overemphasize the spiritual sort of theosophic aspect of the Quran but the Quran is a really realistic education book there is space for spirituality but there is no shying away in inculcating raising questions and this is where we need to invest in teachers really to be able to take on challenge uh, reflect on how they deliver and be prepared to change and that professional reflective sort of you know framing of what we do is so important but you know reality is uh, it is a very sensitive area and we need to resource these teachers remember our sector is probably one third more than one third is made of volunteers they never had teacher education or training so we don't have to really expect too much and, and we, we therefore we need to really create impactful competent Muslim teacher education programs online whatever because we need to get these people skilled upskilled definitely uh, and that that would be a way forward in show Okay, Jazakallah khair. And on that note too, I'll put a I'll put a link down for anyone that's interested from the Right Question Institute on this point of inquiry and a framework for that. It's called the Right Question Institute. Really excellent resources for developing these question asking skills in students. So I'll put that there. Uh, Brother Zafar, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Jazakallah, Dr. Sain, for that very uh, powerful, short exposition. Uh, really thought provoking. I, I just want to sort of uh, frame the question around, uh, if I use the analogy of uh, judo, I could be a student of judo and I could read every book and know every technique uh, about judo because I'm a student of judo. But when I get onto the ring and have a fight, uh, then I, I know I can't enact any of that. And is, is our understanding of Islam and Islamic knowledge and the transmission, and if it's not being enacted in our lives, then it's similar to that judo expert who learns everything about everything about judo, but cannot actually enact it or live it. And for us as Muslims, we have to, Islam is to know, but also to practice. Islam is the name of a practice and not only uh, the knowledge. The second part I'd like you, your thoughts on, do you see the teacher of Quran or the teacher of Islamic studies and the teacher of say science or mathematics or English language all having a similar impact on their students? Thank you. Uh, yeah. The first point is very important good two questions. Um, you are absolutely right. I mean, experiential, dimension is so important in our subject. Um, this is where I suppose the limitations of the transmission, instruction, text-oriented Islamic education glaringly fails uh, because the only pedagogy they come up with is memorization. And this is not learning by heart, i.e. to become part of you what you learn, mechanical repetition of some sort of deposited knowledge. Uh, and, and therefore, of course, we have heavy knowledge centered practice. And you are right, this knowledge, if has never had a chance to be practiced, or if it is practiced in a minimum way, it won't shape the attitudes in the minds uh, of the learner. So, I mean, for this, of course, we have to think of Islamic education or Islamic schools they should not really be thought as if they are separate from society. So Islamic education is probably the subject area where children learners need to be created opportunities of seeing as a kind of a continuation of family, continuation of the society. You can't really isolate, you know. Um, and, and this is a problem because many people assume when they teach Islamic education, they kind of assume they're going to make these learners one day like great scholars or imams or, I don't know, uh, 
um, subjects, theologians, they don't realize actually our task is to be able to provide basic Islam literacy, encourage emotional, spiritual connection with faith as much as we can. And that should be really the priority of our learning uh, outcomes. <laughs> and therefore the practice goes away because we are obsessed with these huge knowledge, chunks of knowledge to be um, introduced. So we, we got to advocate you know, ex experiential, I suppose, Islamic education pedagogies. And, and probably that with you know, balance, the dangers of overemphasizing uh, cognitive development or knowledge accumulation. And if you don't have uh, chances for young people to engage with what they learn, and of course it won't really have any effect, not transformation. And we all know, everybody knows probably that Muhammad Sallallahu really taught people, for example, you know, a, a Bedouin and Arabi turned up one day in the masjid. He just saw Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam briefly and he said, okay, well, what Muhammad, what do you want from us? He said, well, okay, believe in God, do good deeds, be good to yourself and your neighbor. And he just left. Three, four in, in big pieces of information. And Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam turned to his companion. He said, well, if this man keeps his three things, he is surely guaranteed paradise. Look, there, there is no, you know, obsession with knowledge and details and this and that. So in other words, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually taught, that's why it's Arabic, they call, they call this Jawami al kalim That means, you know, he had the gift of teaching effectively in few words. Ma they say. So in other words, actually, in early Islamic practice, knowledge, because it has to be useful, al-nafir, for the learner, as prophetic hadith says, they were much more interested in the experiential dimension of the learner. And therefore, the Sahaba used to have, you know, 10 verses and would not go to the 11th verse until they understood that. So we got to get, you know, in this day and age, of course, the practice of curriculum, I don't know, assessment. We got to get, find a way to balance uh, the experiential dimension, the practice, what you call, with obviously the reflective knowledge dimension. But ultimately, we are not in the business of simply passing on a lot of information, like a banking model. But we are really interested in, you know, character education, long-term formation of feelings, attitudes, skills. And that's why in Islamic education, we've got to have the most talented people who understand human psychology, I suppose. So you can't do this unless you have studied a little bit of human psychology, how, how kids learn, child children learn. So it, it is a crucial, crucial point. And this should be part of our teacher education programs. Um, your second question, which I must admit I forgot now, brother Zafer, uh, but we'll come back to that, uh, inshallah, if you remind me. We go on to some other question. Okay. Um, yes, we can go next to Abdus Salam Adam. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. Um, um, Colin, I'm joining the meeting from Minneapolis, Minnesota in the United States, and alhamdulillah, glad to be here. Uh, the beauty of Islam is, of course, the fact that it's a, it's, a, it's a religion that's meant to be practiced in every place and time. And our challenges are the, you know, the immigrant Muslims versus those who are already in the West and the challenges of the youth that you have addressed. So... Um, with the experience that we have seen in the UK, I think it's ahead of the United States in terms of you know, early Muslim immigrants settling there and forming institutions. And so the challenge of the West versus the East, people like to create dichotomy and some kind of uh, this versus that kind of uh, challenges. So how much have our communities matured at this point? Is the issues that you are telling us today that are very important. Is it more the Western Muslims that are expected to bring about this change and transformation? Or do we still rely on the home countries, which many people are still tied to in some way? So if you can just discuss that. Jazakallah. It's a very good question. Yeah, of course, most of this applied to Muslim minority context. That's very true. Uh, I, I would say, actually, they do apply to Muslim majority context too with only degree of difference. So clearly as minority communities in, in the West, we do experience this intensively. Our communities, of course, they are disadvantaged in many levels. Uh, 
But the reality is, as someone who has experience of both Muslim majority and the minority context, uh, and somebody who has gone through the traditional Islamic learning, I would say these observations are actually applicable to Muslim majority context too. And if you had a chance to look at my book, I obviously to mitigate against this maybe criticism that my empirical findings were based on Muslim minority context, I did this study in, uh, replicated the empirical study in Kuwait, you know, very rich, uh, affluent Muslim uh, majority, Arabic speaking context. And Islamic education obviously came out exactly the same kind of outcome, sadly, all with different levels of maybe foreclosed mindsets. So these are the teaching and learning of Islam is a really problem in the 21st century, definitely. And there are reasons for this because of you know, secular Western modernity, colonial experience political changes, the disfranchising Islamic institutions of learning. There are many reasons uh, for this. But the fact is, teaching and learning of Islam has lost its dynamism uh, in the Muslim majority context, you know, over, over a century now. Uh, and that is part of the problem. So this educational reckoning goes by all the way to uh, people like Ibn Khaldun, Imam Ghazali. They all had these great scholars space to say, really, we got to make education dynamic because kind of survival of Islam depends on that beyond the politics. So these are not simple short observations based on Muslim minority context, uh, but actually they have historical uh, sort of background as well as relevance to Muslim majority context. Just look at how Islamic universities function. You know, we have international Islamic universities, we have university sector in the Islamic world, just look at their pedagogic outputs. Sadly, it's not a cozy picture. So there is a problem, what I call pedagogic educational cultures in majority Muslim communities. They simply lost that dynamism with all various reasons. And it is not only a matter of religious institutions, by the way. Look at the secular institutions in the Islamic world. They exactly have the same problems. You know, albeit they have secular obsessions, sadly, ideological obsessions. But the, the kind of free educational culture is not at all available, even in secular institutions. Uh, yes, change is taking place, definitely. Our communities are becoming maturer as we have third, fourth generation in the West, much more confident young people. When I began my journey almost eight, 15 years ago, I developed this course, I only had three people. And some people even suggested that you know, this this, this vision of transformative Islamic education will never find its way to people because it's too challenging. Well, here I am, and in fact, it's very true because initially most of the Islamic education institutions didn't want to house this perspective. But later on, you know, gradually, as people began to think, and as young people who are in the leadership positions now of these institutions, they realize the significance of rethinking Islam within the context they are in, and how much it depends on competent education and leadership, they realize, yes, we've got to rethink within. Uh, otherwise, we're going to really lose the chance of at least offering a good, adequate Islamic education provision to our young people. So I would say I'm optimistic, genuinely. And this sort of generation is crucial. Uh, obviously, the stories are different from America and Europe because American Muslims are tend to be you know, maybe middle class educated, but the educational challenges are the same. But I'm confident that now we are actually at the stage where we do have, from my yard district, even the most foreclosed sort of uh, leaders, they are voicing the need to rethink, which to me indicates genuinely people want to uh, uh, engage in formulating, in developing, maybe effective, education provision, because it's in the best interest of everyone, actually. Uh, but it is a difficult stage. You know, you've got to really be self-reflective to be able to open to alternatives. So I am optimistic, inshallah, and I, I do see a lot of really empowering new uh, educational leaders are actually coming up in our communities, inshallah. Okay, Jazakallah khair. I saw we had um, first sister Leila. I wanted to check you had your hand up. But maybe you put it down, Sister Leila. I think her hand went down. Yeah, we'll be, Sister Leila. Yeah, we'll ah. Assalamu alaikum. Yes. Alaikum yes. 
Um, I, I did, I, I, because he responded to it uh, with, when he was speaking. So, um, but I'll just say, um, Jazakallah Khair for the insightful um, session and um, bringing this to the forefront again. But, but we're learning a lot. Jazakallah Khair. Jazak. Okay, we'll go to Sister Asma and then to Suleiman. Sister Asma. Assalamu alaikum uh, I think uh, Brother Suleiman was first, so I would I won't uh, pass his uh, turn. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, Suleiman, yes, Mr. Brother Suleiman, if you're with us, you'll need to unmute. I'll click here. I've invited you to unmute, Brother Suleiman. Okay, we can come back uh, to you, Brother Suleiman, Sister Asma, if you'd like to go then, please. <laughs> My name is Esma Klasa. I am an expert on education and identity and Tarwia uh, 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 issues in the Netherlands. I'm sorry, na uh, English is not my native language, so maybe I'm not uh, speaking as clear and eloquent as you all do. But uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Shaheen for giving us the opportunity to uh, learn from you. And uh, I read your book, of course, and it, uh, I recognize a lot of what you're saying, just like Brother Yahya uh, says, it's really uh, yeah, an immense uh, work, mashallah. May Allah bless you for it and reward you. Um, yeah, as you were saying, I recognize um, uh, the, the, the lack of... Uh, uh, knowledge on transformational uh, uh, education in Islamic uh, education system. Uh, we have uh, about uh, 60 Islamic schools, alhamdulillah, in, uh, in the Netherlands. They're all government funded, but they're also uh, primary schools. Uh, and what uh, uh, in the about uh, in the 1980s, the first Isla Islamic school was established. And um, it was a lot of copy paste work from the from the home countries. So, uh, Alhamdulillah, I um, uh, I was asked to uh, to help um, write an, an Islamic uh, curriculum for the uh, primary education uh, system here in, in the Netherlands for these Islamic schools. Uh, and it was quite a challenge because um, uh, uh, yeah, there's really. Um, it's important for, uh, for the, the leaders of Islamic schools that they understand this kind of information because there's a lot of, uh, um, uh, they don't always agree on, on this uh, subject. So I would like to invite you to come uh, also again and to talk to, this, uh, to the leaders of the schools. Um, currently, I'm uh, asked to write a uh, uh, curriculum uh, for the uh, uh, secondary schooling as well because we didn't have any secondary schools up till recently but now since uh, their new lo uh, law has been launched uh, they um, yeah we we are going to establish alhamdulillah about five or six new islamic schools in the netherlands and uh, well, my question is actually uh, do you have a kind of a blueprint for islamic curricula based on the uh, yeah transformative uh, uh, education because i would like to yeah, uh, if you can share it with us, it would be really uh, very helpful. And uh, that's actually my question. Jazakallah. <laughs> Jazakallah. Thank you. I know your wonderful work. I'm very pleased that you are leading um, Islamic schools. And I think there are like 50 schools that you are looking after. And maybe more even. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> currently even 60, alhamdulillah. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a very good point. Obviously, the, the very first practical thing to do, generally speaking, for Islamic schools, which I, at least the one I know in the UK, they, they tend to not to do, uh, you know, you can't really easily develop a curriculum unless the educational vision is very clear. So I would say in a diagnostic stage, you know, why don't you invite stakeholders? This could be parents, I don't know, teachers, head teachers, or more or less the teacher that you are actually involved with developing the Islamic education curriculum is to, to say what is it that we want to achieve out of, I don't know, three years of edu Islamic education provision. So this diagnostic stage, I think, is so crucial uh, and invite people to share their vision of what education is in Islam. People tend to not to think this basic stuff when they're involved in teaching and how would they go prioritize what should come first? Is it the knowledge, faith development, values, or the context that they are living in? So clearly the, the curriculum has to be contextual. 
Uh, and there are actually steps to follow. Uh, in fact, this is now in some of my students at Warwick, this is second term. One of our module is Islamic pedagogy and one task is to develop a prototype Islamic education curriculum for primary and secondary schools. Uh, so they always look at you know, how curriculum is designed, what is an instruction-based curriculum, what is a learner experience-based curriculum. So you've got to look at the curriculum design models and then depending on your own initial brainstorming, uh, you, you get to really clarify your vision, your values, and the content you want to pr prioritize. So I would say there are practical steps, but the first thing would be to make sure that the curriculum you are developing makes sense to those are going to deliver and makes sense to obviously what is expected by the community and by scholars. I think typically people invite scholars of Sharia to just check the knowledge content, but I think this should be the last because teachers are in the position of saying how best we can now package in a curriculum framework is uh, knowledge and emotions and uh, you know, faith development and value development. Um, so I would say go to the standard curriculum design framework that are widely available. And invite teachers to have regular reflection on what they do in terms of how they understand what education is in Islam. Uh, and then come up with kind of a shared, I suppose, formulation. And then the next thing is, of course, is to agree in what kind of content you want to deliver and how you want to deliver, how you want to assess. So these are really could be done with series of workshops. In, in an ideal world, I would say, you know, I would love to see research-based Islamic education curriculum development. This could be done even in a kind of a, a education research framework over a year or 18 months. You could have actually a research framework for this uh, and you can develop probably a curriculum that is based on real experience of children, learners, expectation of parents and community and Islamic scholarship. You could all bring this together. But that requires developing actually a good research project, Sister Asma. I don't know whether you have that luxury, but I would recommend doing that. In fact, all Islamic associations of Islamic schools, they should have such research-based development plans. This is not a matter of a couple of scholars coming and saying, okay, you know, I want this content to be taught. I don't know the Turkish community and the Maghribi community. You will go nowhere with this. You know, they will all go back to what they have learned in the past. But a research-based strategy will get curriculum actually developed in a much more rigorous way and will include the learner experiences, teachers and parents. So it, exciting. I, I, would, I would say that do propose this to to whoever board you are serving, whether you could do a research-based development for your curriculum plan. And that will be really a proper contextual curriculum development too. Jazakallah khair, it's very enlightening. Thank you so much, Jazakallah. Thank you. Okay, Jazakallah khair. So we're just at the hour mark. Um, Dr. Shaheen, I wanted to see, do you have a little time to take a few more questions or sure, do we need sure, to wrap no things problems, up? Inshallah. Yes, absolutely, no problems. Okay, so maybe we can go for another 15 minutes here and then we can wrap up. I see a lot of hands have gone up and then we have a couple questions in the chat. So I think Soliman um, was able to get back the audio back. So we can go first to Brother Soliman. No, no, I think, I think I'll skip. <laughs> let, let the yeah. others go. If there's, time, if there's time, I'll come in. Let them, uh, I'll, I'll let it go. Okay. Okay, so I'll go to two questions in the chat first, and they're, and they're similar, so maybe we can combine them here, and then we can go back to the hands up. So the first one reads, in order to make Islamic education a transformative experience to, to the students, what adaptations do you recommend to the pedagogy used as Islamic schools? And then more generally, uh, Sister Leila wrote and asked, are there recommendations for specific actionable steps for Islamic schools to take? Yeah, the first practical step, get whoever is involved in charge of Islamic education, teachers. The key thing is the teachers, always, because teacher is a facilitator. I think get organized uh, workshops, opportunities for reflecting the teachers to clarify what really they think their role is and how they envisage you know, delivering this. Yeah. So see whether they have a transmission model in mind. They have, I don't know, a teacher-centered approach, a learner-centered approach. I think that, that for me is the key to get teachers actually reflecting on how they deliver, how they teach. And you got to have a supervisor, I suppose, to see oversee this. And you could do what we call learning conversation. I don't know whether you are familiar with this concept. 
it's in personal construct psychology, well-known tradition in psychology that really teachers use a lot as psychologists. So you could create like learning conversation framework in your school and Islamic educators could have regular meetings to actually reflect on openly uh, how they envisage what education is and how they are delivering this. I think getting this awareness in the practitioners is the key because we as teachers tend to forget. In fact, we are modeling actually children's learning and the way we teach uh, at actually is much more effective. Um, and then we, we should really look at the degree to which our teachers are familiar with diversity of pedagogic practices. Remember, you know, obviously Islamic education is so complex. You know, there are times for Quran, Hadith, Islamic culture, values. It's a very complex, obviously, curriculum we want to deliver. There is space for heart by learning by heart. There is space for reflection questions. I would say check some sort of a diagnostic um, what we call is needs analysis, pedagogic needs analysis, to what extent your teachers have got a repertoire of pedagogies in mind. Do they really understand what is experiential learning, for example? Uh, and, and to me, the key thing is in the terbia model, which is my key concept, really the teacher should be a murabbi. And you know, everybody probably who was curious about this word, this word is a very interesting word because it's, a, it's an Arabic verbal noun it comes from the three possible really roots, which basically means nurture, care, but also facilitate uh, development and, and, and uh, increase something. And finally, to guide and to reform, aslaha. The word terbiya linguistically has these three important uh, meanings. So a true murabbi really cannot be a teacher text centered transmission center teacher. You know, a true murabbi is, therefore, in, in, in ancient Arabic, the classical scholars say, you know, the clouds, they have, obviously, by virtue of bringing rain, they facilitate growth of vegetation. So they metaphorically say the clouds have, have got educative function. What a beautiful way. And therefore, probably Brother Yahya will come across in my chapter seven, I call my theory humbly, cloud and grass theory of education in Islam. Because a true murabbi, a true teacher, a cloud, exactly like a cloud, he or she actually facilitates, doesn't dump knowledge on learners, doesn't toward the coerce, coercion and the discipline simply. Uh, so in a, in a true, really terbiya model, the teacher has got to have a self-awareness of being a facilitator full stop. And that facilitation, of course, is the key, then turns into guidance, which is like coaching and mentoring. So really, the Murabi model, the Terbiya model, is developmental, learner-led, and it's transformative because it has to facilitate growth in the learner. This could be knowledge, could be emotional development, personality development. So a simple way of putting transformative Terbiya model in practice is to listen what actually Terbiya means, actually. And the result are very simple. The teacher is the key, has to be transformative, just like somebody brings a rain facilitate, guide, and it has to be in the service of the learner. It cannot be the other way around. So these are the kind of practical points. I would say that you could start in making the Islamic education classroom, space, school, embodying transformative vision of Islam. Mazakallah khair. I see um, Sister Aisha of the Al-Ghazali Children's Project has a hand up in the camera even. Mashallah, Sister Aisha. I'll click, uh, I'll give you unmute there. There you go. Well, just listening to our brother Abdullah, uh, you know, it's wonderful. Of course, it has to be tar tarbiya and it has to be the transformative thing, even to have children attracted to their faith these days when the competition is so great with the iPhone and videos. The, um, the way the Ghazali Children's Project started, I mean, I became a Muslim reading Ghazali in 1967. Then oh, sure. had... 10 years at Azhar, you know, Fik and Tejweed and all the rest, and loving Ghazali. And then we opened in uh, 79, 80 in Cambridge, England, the Islamic Text Society to start bringing out books. And then when I had to come back to Kentucky, I'm here in Kentucky, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Muhammad Ali Clay. <laughs> I had to come back so my parents could die here. And after 
serving, I have an MA in education and curriculum development. I opened up Franz Vitae in 79, you know, in 90, 90, 97, right? So the Ghazali Children's Project, one day Hamza Yusuf came to me and he said, you know, my kids are going to an Islamic school and it's not working out. And then I started thinking about my own grandchildren who were various ages between, it was five, she's now nine. Well, I, I decided I have to do something for the children. And since I loved Ghazali because he gave the inner tarbiyah and the meaning and purpose, and I've dealt with so many young people who feel everything is meaningless and without purpose because if it becomes rote or just doing so many things. So that was the birth of the project started about 11 years ago. We got a million dollars from Templeton. We've now got books one through seven. But what struck me is it's now gone into 17 language. Uzbeki, Russian, two brothers from Kyrgyzstan and Kazakh said, there's no way we could bring the Central Asian youth into Islam without making it, I hate to say this, fun, right? And uh, at practice of the inner sunnah, because we can do easily all the tens of this and this and this, but how do you transform a young person? And with the tarbiyah, of course, it has to be parents involved as well, because you can't just learn this in a class uh, without having the role model. So even the London mosque, Abdul Hakim Winter, has just taken on 200 families at the mosque to do the Ghazali project. We have about 450 schools from Pakistan and all of but what I'm learning is that you know, the teachers of whatever culture or country they're in have their own enthusiastic way of doing this. And we do so much of it, uh, Brother Abdullah, with um, uh, play acting, because often kids, you know, you're speaking of tarbiya and the right way of doing things. You can, you can so easily be told, be humble or share. And if you tell a group of children share, well, they think it must be bad because mother is saying it. But if you have them play not sharing, oh, you can't hold my truck. Oh, and then you say, now play share. And they think, oh, would you like to have a cookie? And they notice it's mm -hmm. feeling okay. It doesn't, it doesn't take away from anything. It was easy to do. So I'm finding they make videos all over the world for the gazalichildren.org website. And to see what the kids come up doing it wrong and doing it right, well, it's hilarious to start with. Mm -hmm. but, you know, um, it uh, just to bring it back to me, it changed my whole life because I've been publishing Islamic spirituality uh, for how many years? <laughs> Zillions, right? I'm I'm old now, and I have to say that until I took the first seven books and had them translated into English by scholars and sat down on this couch here in the kitchen, my office is in the kitchen, and slowly went through and took every single point and put it into a wonderful story, you know, because we remember stories. And then I discovered Ghazali, oh, he did everything by stories too, and then all the subsequent roomies, they grabbed his stories. But it was just so amazing for me not to read these books, which are hard and above my head and what... Abdul Hakim Winter does is unreal. We publish his books. But when I read it, when I shut the book, I always found I'm the same person because I didn't get it to the heart. But by putting all these key things into stories and bringing the inner meaning out, you know, children get it. My grandchildren, little Bilal and Medina, they're only now, they started at five and eight. They, their whole lens is now through Mamal Ghazali, as is mine. And so I just want to recommend to the teachers out there that um, we're happy to help in any way, you know, that we can. And um, that actually just to say that it works. I'm sorry to do this long speech here, <laughs> but when you spoke of Tarbiya, uh, that's the only thing we could come up with. And Alhamdulillah, uh, there is a need and it even to see it's gone into Urdu. I gave a talk to 250 Indonesian educators so I'd like all of you to consider adding this as a supplement to your projects, to your curriculum. It's a wonderful supplement to add in. I mean, and thank you. <laughs> thank you, Yahya. Yeah. Thank you, Jazakallah. Thank you for sharing. Wonderful, absolutely, absolutely. You know, Ghazali, the philosopher, Ghazali, the theologian, Ghazali, the um, Islamic law 
specialist. All are interesting. But the most interesting part is Ghazali, the educator. Right. This is this is what we work on when I train my own teachers. Um, he, he says, isn't it, when you teach children, he says, you could teach about the ahkam salah or ahkam saum, conditions of, of how to observe fast. He said, that's fine. This is cognitive. They will learn yeah. this. They will repeat back. But he says, you know, when the children realize actually when you're fasting, you should be also good. You begin to observe fasting with your heart. Yeah. He has a developmental approach yeah. to the meaning of learning Islam. This is so embodied. This is, the, I call this love of learning, mm -hmm. uh, shaping the classical Islamic heritage. And you might be interested, I just published a short chapter on love of learning the Islamic tradition. And oh, I love Zali that. is one of my examples. So we, we obviously got to be critically looking at our heritage, but definitely all of our scholars, hmm. I can say the same thing to even, even Taymiyyah, which I've worked on a lot. When it comes to education, these people left us with a legacy of transformative vision. And we need to really draw on. I'm very pleased that obviously you've owned Ghazali's heritage. And alhamdulillah, what I hear, you've turned into a practical model for various learners and teachers and parents. So may Allah bless your efforts, inshallah. Thank you so much, my dear. Yeah, thank you. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. And actually, I'll share that Sister Aisha came and read to my students last year from the Al-Ghazali during Ramadan, and we hope to do it again from the, the mysteries of fasting. So we'll be in touch, uh, Sister Aisha, inshallah. Thank you, my dear. Thank you, Yaya. Um, so I think we'll try to wrap up here. I'd like to give Sister Seema a chance to ask perhaps the final question for now, and then we can, we can, we can conclude our, our session together. Uh, Sister Seema. Inshallah. Let's see if Assalamu alaikum, everyone. So nice to hear this discussion and so grateful for the presentation, although I missed the beginning part. Uh, I wanted to encourage folks to consider the culture in the school. And that goes back to making sure that we have the teachers on the same page and that they're constantly working towards an Islamic pedagogy but it, it probably won't get done without looking carefully at the culture. And I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that there are, you know, educators from across the world that came together in Dr. Memon and Dr. Abdullah's book, Curriculum Renewal for Islamic Education. And I think that could be helpful to a lot of folks. It's recently published by Rutledge. Thank you for doing this, uh, Brother Yaya. Yeah. Salam alaikum. Okay, Jazakallah uh, khair. Dr. Shaheen, any closing thoughts before I, I close with a dua? Jazakallah um, khair. Thank you for all of your attention and giving up your time and joining us. Uh, I think it's been an enriching uh, experience for me. I've learned a lot. I hope it's been useful to all of you. I would say we didn't have a chance to explore um, transformative Islamic education also as I said, it involves challenge, carefully guided challenge, critical thinking. So I would say critical pedagogies are also part and parcel of Islamic education. We tend to you know, overlook that and it's crucial. I say this because the last sister said, you know, I talk about how do we change the educational culture in our schools? You see, this is not a matter of simple change in ABC. You know, good education and inspiring education is obviously an embodied values in a place. So you've got to really create this culture of learning and teaching that is based on respect, but inquiry, critical reflection, addressing all kinds of issues, spiritual or social injustice or inequality. Ultimately, our task is to enable Islamic values to shape our young people's hearts and minds. And, and enable that you know even non-Muslims have complete confidence and trust in what we do. We can only do that if we also have this uh, open, transparent uh, vision for Islamic education, and I call this Islamic public education. So uh, transformative education is always interested in learners' development. It's not at all to do with the teachers feeling better about themselves and exercise power. It's other way around. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran gives up that in the interest of enabling the first 
learner of the Quran, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the interest of enabling Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's spiritual crisis to be addressed, this should be our model. The transformative education begins when we prioritize the interest of the learner, how we can enable, facilitate. That is the heart of the Tarbiya model. And part of that is sometimes raising critical questions because we cannot achieve justice unless we raise critical questions too. We want young people confident in their faith, socially responsible, environmentally responsible. You can only bring about this kind of mindset if you balance the spiritual and with the uh, reflecting heart, what the Quran calls to bring about biha, to facilitate, nurture hearts capable of reflection, thinking. Jazakumullah khair for having me. Wow, Jazak, a beautiful closing ref uh, reflection there, Dr. Abdullah. I've just put in the chat again for everyone the link uh, to the resources and perhaps that new article you can share um, and I'll add it to this uh, link. And sorry, by the way, one just self-advertising, yeah. by the way. Uh, yeah. I do teach courses at Warwick University. We do have an online open day, 15th of March, UK time, 1 p.m. I'll just put this address if anybody wants to find out about the kind of short courses we teach. Um, if, if you allow me to just share that link. Please, so yes, can, please. So you can learn, um, just a second, about the various professional development courses we have um, developed at Warwick. And if you're interested to find out, inshallah, you can join us if I could. Yes, I can add it to the document too if you put it in the chat. I'll That's right. So, yeah, yeah, just an hour we'll just introduce the Warwick Transformative Islamic Education programs, what we call the Terbiya programs. And we do have a short course, which is only two months online. If anybody's interested, they could actually find out more. Uh, and they obviously look at the kind of research we do as well, inshallah ta'ala. And I'll do put the, the final love chapter as well for you to look at, inshallah, as you close. I'll get the details. Okay, sure. Jazakallah khair. So I'll just close with this dua in which our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa would often close his meetings with. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika ashadu an Allah ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. And I'll then close with Surah Al-Asr, which was a practice of the companions. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillahi ar-Rahmani rahim Wal asr in al-insana lafi kurs illa ladina aminu wa amilu salahati wa tawassaw bil haqqi wa tawassaw bil sabr. Sadaqallahu azim. Okay, so thank you everyone. Jazakallah khair. I will share the recording and uh, any additional links here we have in the chat. I will add those, inshallah, to the, to the document. And Brother Zafar, anything that you need to mention here in the closing? No, I just wanted to say thank you very much uh, to Brother Yahya and Abdullah Sain for hosting this thing today. I really appreciate it and I'm sure we all benefited. Also, Brother Yahya, if you could get that open day message and post it on our GIS uh, WhatsApp group. Uh, I think there's a bigger group there as well that would benefit from that work. Allah bless you all. And uh, we'll call on you again, Dr. Abdullah, uh, in a few Inshallah. months' time to come back to this uh, scholar series of ours and interrogate another part of your work, Inshallah. Thank Inshallah. you very Inshallah. much, everybody, for accepting our invitation to be here. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Okay. Okay. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.